posts to the uh okay. it's preparing to live stream dyke got it i was able to ah, it says this meeting is being live streamed good there we go uh did you guys happen to see the chat come across the youtube oh you're not on youtube never mind yes the chat did come across YouTube. okay beautiful. and it says meeting is now streaming live so i think we're good, good. i think we're good okay all right it still says huh okay Okay, we're getting and I'm, I'm gonna close this. I think okay. we should kick, I think we should kick off the meeting, assume that it's gonna be live. Yep. If it's not, we'll we'll uh, post the recorded one and and get it out to everybody that's signed in. Sounds good. So yeah. let me um, officially welcome everyone to tonight's uh, webinar about uh, how to use data to improve your driving. So on behalf of the NNJR chief instructors, who were uh, many of whom are on the Zoom with us tonight and our track chair, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the latest NNJR YouTube classroom. Tonight's topic is turning squiggly lines into action. Uh, I'm Bill Gilbert. Our uh, guest speaker is Peter Krause. And many of you remember Peter from our winter high performance driving seminar and our instructor seminars. And besides being a pro driving coach, successful racer, and VIR expert, uh, Peter has worked with video and data systems for many years. And today he uses them in his coaching work with DE drivers, club racers, and pro racers. So he really knows what works. Uh, just as importantly, he knows how to quickly analyze video and data to find the next thing to work on. As a result of that, tonight's session will be much more about common driving mistakes and ways to improve driving than about the specifics of data, hardware, or software. So before we dive in, a couple of suggestions to those of you watching. You have the slides available to follow along if you wish, but plan to take lots of notes as Peter has a lot to add that's not on the slides. Um, we've asked Peter to add color, not to cover the details on the slides since you already have those. And you've noticed that the three sets of slides cover three technologies, but they follow the same sequence. We'll cover AIM first, and then highlight only the differences for Garmin and for VBOX. So if you're a Garmin or a VBOX user, uh, please pay attention during the AIM discussion since much of what you'll wanna know will already be, it won't be repeated when we go to Garmin or VBOX. Uh, if you're on YouTube, we're gonna hold most questions until the end, but please don't wait to type your question into the YouTube chat. If there's something that needs clarifying, we, we will do our best to, uh, uh, to do that in, in real time, but be aware that there is a 15 to 20 second delay between us and your YouTube feed. Um, and one word before I turn it over to, to, to Peter on why we created this webinar. Uh, <clears throat> we see many drivers with data systems in their cars, but struggling to use them. In fact, some are just expensive lap timers. And I include myself in that struggling group. Um, as a result, the chief instructor set out to create tonight's educational resources. And we went straight to one of the country's premier experts to help us all learn. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce Peter Kraus. Take it away, Peter. Wow, Bill, uh, Dyke, Dan, Lester, Al, Drew, thank you so much for the invitation to talk about something that is near and dear in my heart, uh, which is taking these uh, small measures of our performance on track and uh, the way these devices just log this information or record it for later review and turn it into an action plan that you can put to use right away. I don't think anybody uh, doesn't think that a, a PCA DE is a very busy place. Uh, club racing weekends, also a tremendously busy place and not much time between sessions in order to be able to formulate an action plan, let alone review the information. A lot of people look at the uh, technology um, 
uh, with some trepidation, which they should, because I don't think any of these people make it very easy to use. I really don't. Um, one of the reasons why uh, I became a dealer for many different brands and sold a lot of equipment, uh, millions of dollars worth of equipment over the course of many years, I have since sold that business and returned primarily to coaching, uh, was to learn how to use this. But also, uh, I built my coaching business entirely on objective measures. I didn't want to give anybody my opinion about what happened. What I wanted to do was look at the information first, then make educated decisions next. So this is uh, really not going to be going to the next slide, uh, talking about learning how to use the software. The, the, the trepidation that most people have is not about reviewing the data. It's about uh, navigating the software, sometimes even navigating Windows and Mac OS. Uh, some of the equipment has uh, been designed so that you don't need to download anything or use a laptop of any kind. And that is the primary boon, uh, which is the success of the catalyst. But for others, uh, they need more information and they can get that additional information from AIM and from VBOX. So uh, do I think one system is better than another? No, I think they all measure the same things with roughly the same accuracy. Uh, the reliability is good now. Uh, the three systems, obviously, that Bill covered that we talked, uh, we said we were going to talk about was primarily the AIM Solo 2DL SmartyCam combination, which is ubiquitous in the paddock. Uh, that, that system uh, and data in general, even five years ago, was not near as common as it is now. The Garmin Catalyst, which came out in uh, September of 2020, uh, has become a very popular uh, device because it's simple and easy. Uh, the V-Box is recommended by uh, Porsche uh, Motorsports and Porsche Motorsports North America. And so that's not uncommon to see that sort of equipment go ahead. So let's take a look at the next slide. Um, this is something that is really important to me. I think that a lot of people with the trepidation that they have, uh, about this stuff uh, tend to take a rather negative view about video and data. And what we really want to do is just say, you know, this is not a judgment. Uh, this is not a tattletale. This is just what we would have liked to do. Uh, we remember what we would have liked to do rather than what we did. And that is the, the reason why we're looking at this information. But the most important thing for everyone to realize is that uh, every driver is capable of punching above their weight. Uh, isolated moments of flowing brilliance. I think that we all tend to look at a lap as a singular measure of our performance, when in fact, it's the result of a dozen uh, different control inputs, turning the wheel, pushing the pedals over the course of one lap's distance. And if we could find and identify and focus on those areas of exceptional performance, we could look back at that and do more of it. And that is the crux of what we're talking about today. Um, look for the good stuff, then do more of it. The graphs that we're going to use today are graphs that work with every system. They doesn't need to be a complicated system. It really just needs, uh, I, I know everybody here is familiar with the idea of brake force uh, being equated to how much the shoulder harnesses press against your chest. And that would be a negative deceleration number. Any sort of push into the back of the seat is a positive acceleration number. You don't need a brake pressure or throttle position sensor to tell whether or not you're accelerating or decelerating. So let's look at the next slide. The first step is always going to be the easiest, and that is to review the video. We all assimilate information through the video much more quickly than we do even reading or talking about complex concepts. So the idea is to analyze the execution of fundamental skills by looking at the video. You can listen via the audio whether or not somebody is back to power. So very often, you know, one of the common uh, mistakes that students mid-grade, mid-level, and upper-level students make is accelerating more than once. So they uh, finish their braking early, they get back on power, 
Uh, they realize that their car is washing out of the particular corner and they get out of the throttle. Then the car tucks his nose back in and they accelerate again. This is very easily seen on video and especially in audio. And if there is a situation where you have a fundamental skill execution, which is to go back to power one time and squeeze onto maximum throttle, this is going to show that information without any squiggly lines at all. That video is. The speed graph, uh, which is a distance, um, basically miles per hour over distance, uh, this graph, this strip chart, the higher it is, the faster you're going, uh, the further from the left to the right you're going, that is the distance of a lap. So the speed graph, we'll talk more about this later. The acceleration braking graph, which is a chart of the forces pushing you back in the seat and pushing you forward under heavy braking against the shoulder harnesses. And then finally, the time compare. One of the interesting things that uh, Ken was talking about was the idea of how to compare a lap with another driver and say, okay, where is that? real big improvement from one driver to another driver occurring, and that shows up in the time compare graph. People naturally assume that you lose time throughout the entire lap, and that is not necessarily true when you're comparing two drivers. 80% of the lap might be the very same as the other driver is doing it, but if you could find and focus on the third of that lap that could potentially be a big opportunity for improvement, then all of a sudden you're doing a lot better. Um, nobody has time, or at least I don't have time to do a lot of sector analysis and A-B comparisons um, throughout the day. What I try to do is uh, focus first on the execution, the best execution of fundamental skills, then once I'm done that, once I've done everything I can with this, the speed graph and the acceleration braking graph, uh, and especially the time compare, we'll definitely spend a lot more time on that because that's important. Then you can go into the deep dive and start carving up the track into pieces, determining the areas of exceptional performance, and then seek to emulate that every time. Um, the A-B comparisons, I wanted to explain that a little bit because... Uh, it is very easy for drivers to get stuck. I think we all know, at least I know, I get stuck every now and then. I don't know where to go further to affect a change that is positive. Uh, but what I can do is I can say, you know, you have a question in your mind of whether or not you should take third gear or second gear in a particular uh, in a in a particular corner. So what you do is you go out and you practice. Uh, going through the, the corner in one particular gear uh, until you're very good at it. And then you practice until you're good at another lap, uh, at another approach or an A-B approach. Then at the end of the day, when you're equally facile and comfortable doing both, then what you do is in the same session, three laps the best you can, A, and then three laps the B, or three laps the prime idea, and three laps, the optional idea. And if you have any sort of dash display, like a solo dash or a solo 2DL with predictive lap timing on it, or the Garmin Catalyst, or the OLED for the V-Box, it will show you right away whether or not you are gaining time or you are losing time with that alternate approach. And that's where I would start if I were stuck. Let's go ahead to the next slide. and and start digging into this. Uh, I think that, you know, this is the most common system. Race Studio 3 has become a very powerful software. And the reason why is because it now integrates video into the top right side. One of the things people need to realize is they don't need to download necessarily after every run from the solo. Just pull the card out of the camera, plug it into your laptop, import it into Race Studio 3. And there's plenty of informational videos to, to show you how to do that. And all of a sudden you'll get the squiggly lines with the video real time, automatically synced together. And you can look at the squiggly lines and realize that some of the influence on the squiggly lines is 
perhaps traffic, or you're out of position, or you're doing this audit uh, augmented with much better information, which includes where you are on track, where the other cars are in relation to you, and this really helps. Let's go to the next slide. The best part about VBOX and, uh, and, and AIM Smarty Cam in particular is these computers, these little cameras are computers. They take the digital information and they write the information on the background of the video in real time. So you see on the background of the video, the actions of your feet on the throttle and brake. You see on the G friction circle, your actions on the steering wheel and how much of the demonstrated capacity of the car you're using at any given time. And then you see most importantly, the money channel, which is the speed on the right-hand side of this particular slide. You then can make assessments on your line that may impact the fact that you are done your braking too soon, back on power. Then all of a sudden you realize you're too uh, much on power and the car is beginning to wash out. So you get out of the throttle and the green bar uh, moves to the left, then you get back on power. Well, you need to fix that. So the line is the most important part. We talk about this all the time in DE, but the reason why the line exists is so that we can most efficiently and effectively uh, execute the best execution of fundamental skills. So braking, this delay from gas to brake, nowhere is it more obvious between the red bar and the green bar of the brake and the throttle. If there's a situation where the brake bar uh, or the throttle bar goes from 100 to 70 to 50 to zero, then you cover ground at great pace before the red bar comes up, that is not an efficient way of using the control inputs of the car to be able to, to seamlessly transition between wide open throttle and maximum brake pressure. The car wants to be told what to do, so you really, really need to do that. Also, this business of hard initial soft trail braking. I will tell you right now, trail braking knows uh, trail braking is a term that many people use, but few people bother to determine whether or not it is a common definition for that. Uh, Skip Barber Racing School stops talking about trail braking. Instead, they renamed it brake turning to differentiate between just turning the wheel and dragging the brake. So their brake, they're trailing the brake into the turn to brake turning, which means a more active promotion of putting all the weight on the outside of the front tire and intentionally creating a greater slip angle in the rear of the car by pivoting the car on the outside front tire. You always want to see a harder initial braking unless the car is loaded up already. So if you're if the wheel is straight or near straight, you definitely want to see a hard initial brake and then you want to see it ebb back. Um, and you need to be able to see a soft trail or a gentle decline in brake pressure that extends past the point of steering input. Very few drivers, even advanced drivers, red group, black group, instructors, everybody that I look at, very few people are really disciplined enough to be able to leave enough speed on the corner. We'll talk more about that later. But the idea of extending the end of braking past the steering input, allowing for a soft trail into the corner. Gas hesitation. I didn't get that. Could you no, you didn't, did you? So mm -hmm. the, the thing about this gas hesitation, full throttle, 85% or above throttle over the course, over the percentage of a lap is a key performance indicator. If you can keep your foot wide open on the throttle for just a moment more in a couple of different places, you can really make a difference to the average speed over a lap. So definitely take a look at that, at the behavior of that green bar and use it as an audit to validate what you think you did, but also determine where, where and what you're going to do next. Next slide. So the video review, again, it's all very simple. 
You're going to look at it. You're going to say, yes, that's what I did. Yes, that's what I did. Yes, that's what I did. And then you're going to find a place you're going like, oh, man, I thought I was on that apex. Well, guess what? That's the next thing you work on next session. I have got to be more accurate. I'm going to put my hyper focus on correcting this difference between what I remember and what actually happened. So fix that first. Um, on this business with the control inputs, this is good practice anyway. The car wants to be told what to do. So you've got to, a car is most stable under slight acceleration. A car is most stable under slight acceleration. So if you are telling the car what to do and, and the car knows that you're telling it what to do, it will behave in a more stable, predictable way. If you are uh, in doubt or hesitant or equivocal or in any way questioning, the car picks that right up. Also, if you are gradual or not committal to the control inputs, the car becomes unstable. So again, we're not asking you to take the car by the scruff of the neck and shake it. We're asking you to tell the car what to do, formulate a plan before you, you do that, uh, to, to know what you're, where you're going and know what you're going to do when you get there, and then do it. This quick break application with slow release is super important. It's totally opposite of what people are taught on the street. The idea of limousine braking, where you sit there and you softly get into the, to the brakes uh, because you don't want to spill your drink or something like that. So here what we have is we want the diametric opposition of that. We want to drive as hard as we can. We want to squeeze on the brake pedal fairly quickly with minimal time and transition between wide open throttle and the application of brakes. And we want that maximum retardation to overcome the rotational mass of the brakes, uh, of, of the brake rotors, the tires, the wheels, and take advantage of some of this aero that some of these modern high-performance GT cars have when you're going 100, 110, 130, 150 miles an hour into some of these longer brake zones. So get that braking on it and then start bleeding out of it. And what that will allow you to do uh, is to uh, have more options further and deeper in the brake zone. We'll definitely get to that uh, on the graphs and, and show you what looks good. Um, braking and steering linkage can be easy to see in the video. I can't tell you how hard it is to overcome the ability to brake up to the turn in point when in fact you really need to brake or slow to closer to the apex area. So we're extending, our goal is to extend the brake release past the initiation of steering input. Not so much that it upsets the car. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons why people tend to make errors like spinning at corner entry is they get in too hot and they say, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I need to turn in here and they pop off the brake after initiating steering and putting the car pirouettes on the outside front tire. Well, realistically, what you're looking to do is, is get the hard initial application done and then bleed out of the brake and trade that for cornering. That is the whole purpose of this business where we say hard brake, gradual bleed, turn in, finish bleeding off the brake as you arrive or just before the apex. In order to determine that, that is how you are going to make the little red ball in the background of the aim, the background of the rendered videos and the catalyst and the background of the friction circle and V-Box to walk around the outside edge. So if it's crosswise, all right, up is brake, down is gas, and then lateral. We want to brake hard, and then we want to walk it around the very edge of the friction circle. And that's how you look at it. So the speed graph should have a particular shape. The speed graph must show us a cleanliness in transitions between wide open throttle and brake, almost like a sawtooth. That's going to also show you areas and opportunities for improvement, like 
this coasting, which would be a gentle decline in, in, the, in the speed, followed by a steeper decline, which obviously indicates active, proactive, and optimistic braking. The other difficulty that people have is when they go back to power, they often finish their braking early. They go to power. They realize they can't. They get out of power. Then they get to where they need to be. Then they go back to power. And so the uh, speed graph shows a double pump of the gas like a W at the bottom of the speed graph. So if you see that W, that means that you went for power and then you thought better of it. And that is an, another thing that you really need to focus on. So acceleration, uh, hesitation at the exit, also shifting. So if you have a uh, speed rise and you see pauses in that speed rise and you have access to the video, you can often see people taking a second or two seconds to move the lever from one shift to another. And that is a cessation in acceleration. So that's what we're looking for there. So using the Ray Studio analysis, all you're going to do is bring this stuff down into the Solo DL. All the information is on the SD card. No reason to go to the Solo 2 DL. Super easy. And then just build two pages in Ray Studio 3 with this speed versus distance and then uh, perhaps a friction circle. And all you have to do is do a search on friction circle in Ray Studio 3 and it will show you James Colburn, Matt Romanowski, a bunch of other people have done a really good job in explaining how to do that. Right now, though, we're just going to look at speed, which is the upper half, the blue trace, and longitudinal G, which is acceleration braking. What I'd like Bill to do is highlight the zero axis in the red graph in the lower graph. And that is the thin black line right there. So anything above that, is thrust back in the seat. Anything below that is the force of your upper body pressed against the shoulder harnesses. Ideally, a really good driver will actually uh, reach similar deceleration at most straight line braking zones. So if you have a situation where one of those uh, downward strokes is not as low as the others, well, that may have an opportunity to break more. Um, if you have a situation where you're habitually overslowing at, at the first break zone uh, to the left, um, right there, if that is lower than the others, and you, then you may have an opportunity to break more softly, easily, and roll more speed into that. This is a particularly, this is a pretty good lap right here. And the driver is very clear about what they want to do. The first order of business is looking at the speed graph and looking at the sawtooth edges at the very top of the trace. The sawtooth edges indicate a full acceleration right up to the point where the driver decides to brake. And that is the first order of business. If you have a situation where it levels out or heaven forbid, uh, looks like a melted uh, ice cream cone, that is a problem. That is gently getting out of the throttle, gently squeezing on the brake. This is a decisive execution of accelerating fully to the point where they decide to brake. So that is really, really helpful. In this screen, you have four pieces of information, speed, GPS longitudinal G, which is acceleration and braking. You don't even need a throttle position sensor or brake pressure sensor or any of that. This is an, an acceptable proxy for what your feet are doing. You have video in the top right corner, and then you have sector times in the bottom right. We'll talk more about that. And that's where you mine for time later. So let's go forward. And here, look for the lazy foot in getting back to throttle. We have zoomed in on the speed graph, the upper graph, an area where the speed is nearly horizontal for a long time. This happens for to a lot of people in turn one at Watkins Glen. So what happens is people slow early and then they go to maintenance throttle and you can watch the video and you can count it off. You can say 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 at that particular speed and realize that the time is ticking away. 
And realistically, what you should be able to do is end the braking closer to the apex area and closer to the point where the car is pointed in the right direction so you can go back to power. Back to power should be the mantra that is in your head, always. Uh, it is reflected also in the lower. So we have a cursor that is at the at the maintenance throttle of speed. And then we have an area right there where the car is neither accelerating nor decelerating. And it is showing us right there in the GPS lo longitudinal acceleration. And this is true for every logging device there is. And you should strive to avoid that, especially after you finish braking and have selected a speed for the corner. Next slide. So then the other way that you can mine information is put up your fastest lap and put up a second lap. So even if you don't have anybody to uh, compare yourself to, you can see and identify and prioritize three areas where you are not consistent. Where you are consistent is areas where the two traces are overlapped on one another. That means that there is no significant difference between the way you are approaching and executing your plan for, for that area of the track. However, for whatever reason, on the first red circle on the left, uh, our driver felt better going a little, getting off the brake and going back to power a little bit sooner at the end of the brake zone for turn three and rolled speed through there. Now, yes, it was still maintenance throttle, but it means that the car is capable and the driver is capable. Then in the middle red, all of a sudden what happened was the car was pointed in the right direction. Uh, everything felt good. The angels called down from heaven and the driver picked that throttle back up. And boy, that's, that darker speed trace starts perking right up. And the minimum speed difference right there, four or five miles an hour. And that is money in the bank right there. And then the last red circle on the green lap, they extended their acceleration phase so that the speed peaked at a higher level than the darker phase. So the most important thing I can tell you is not every best performance is on your fastest lap. So that is the that is a crux you need to come away with from this presentation is your best lap is not necessarily and unlikely to be your best performance in every individual corner. Next slide. So dig in to find opportunities. This is a split report. There's plenty of ways you can find out how to do this better. But if you have a situation where you have a highlighted best lap, which is left to right, the amount of time it takes to go through each sector that the, that the track has been divided up by the software, and there is another uh, blue number that is highlighted outside of that line, that is where you find the opportunity. So this 214.597 best lap could have been a 214.297 if they had done it the same as lap three instead of lap five. Uh, and then in sector five, that was that's another three tenths. So that's six tenths down. Now they're in the thirteens. And then finally, in sector 14, there's another segment that is another three tenths down. Well, now all of a sudden you're in the mid thirteens. And you look at this lap time and you say, man, I'm stuck at 214. No, you're not. You have done other laps that have better jewels that if you can look at that, I would load the video for lap two and I'd look at what I did in sector two and sector five and go, I need to do more of that. Next slide. So the slides show how to zoom in on each sector. This is really helpful. This gives you more detail and it gives you real numbers. Yes, six miles an hour down. Yes, three miles an hour up. Yes, I pushed the pedal harder. Yes, I didn't push the pedal as hard. Next slide. So I think the most important thing is I hear a lot of people in a DE environment say, you know what? I was on a great lap. I was on a really, really good lap. And I ran into so-and-so in turn, between turn 10 and turn 11 at Watkins Glen. And I started crying because I knew that, that I had this ace up my sleeve and I, I wasn't going to be able to get the reward on the display. Well, guess what? 
the, 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 the software will save you. And the software will put together your ability to look at what you might have done, not only what you might have done, but what you did do, perhaps on another unobstructed lap in that area from mm -hmm. there to the finish line. So you can construct an optimal lap or an ideal lap or a best theoretical lap. And I hear a lot of people talk about that. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that because that can be good and that can be a little misleading. But it is an indicator that you did better. That's the really, really good thing. Um, so illustrated above, the blue sector is the fastest. We talk about uh, if you have a question of on any portion of the track, where you should go or what you should do when you get there, um, then you will see a variation and you are not consistent. We talk about DE all the time. Uh, and, and in the highest level of professional racing, these drivers are shooting very tight groups. They are entering the corners at within a mile an hour or tenths of a mile an hour at the same point every time. Their apex speeds are within a mile an hour. Um, so, so really, until you get to that level, it, it, that's what you should be striving for. Um, so that's why I say if there's a big difference between the best theoretical and you have a clean lap, and you have mostly clean laps in the session, then that means that you need to work on your consistency. The goal is to make that spread as little as possible. The downside of that is it may just be you driving to your comfort level. So a lot of people who say, I'm very close to my best theoretical with my fastest lap. No, no, that's not necessarily something to be proud of because you might very well say, I'm willing to drive to this le comfort level, but no more. And, and if you're being very consistent in your, in your driving, then you will have less of a variation. So purposeful, purposeful prioritization, that's the whole goal, is to sift through the information and pick one or two things for the next session. That is the most important thing. Next slide. So we talked a tiny bit about this before. We're going to talk a little bit more. I love this prime option approach. This is what all top teams and top drivers do to determine. As we age and as we do this more and more, we are creatures of habit. So we tend to do the same thing over and over and over again. And yet we expect different results. So drivers go out there and they and they say, you know, man, I think I did better, but, you know, it felt faster, but uh, it's not showing in my time. I went the same or heaven forbid slower. Um, they need to realize, A, a lap is too big. Uh, you really need to focus on a corner or a series of corner complexes uh, to to determine, because if you can if you can improve every individual control input, the whole thing will improve. And it doesn't matter what car you drive, doesn't matter what track you're on, that's the most important thing. If you have no idea what to do next, try, if there is a question in your mind about a particular line or a particular gear selection or a particular placement between uh, a transition between two corners, then develop this prime and option approach, practice it until you're good at it, and then test it. Let the data let the device tell you that it is better or worse. Don't rely on your notoriously inaccurate butt gyro because it's not a good enough sensor. After the line, next priority is throttle and brake commitment. And this is where I spend a majority of my time with. You know what? When I started this private coaching business in 2007, I had friends of mine that said that I would starve. They said, how can you make a living doing something that other people give away for free? And I really wondered about that. I was like, you know, that's a really legitimate question. I've been a right seat uh, DE instructor for uh, uh, 28 years before that. And so I was sitting there saying, yeah, that's a good question. So this technology was emerging at that time in the late 2000s. Uh, and filtering down to uh, a club level and a DE track day level. And so I decided to hang my hat on that. And that is one of the reasons why I'm here and talking to you tonight, because I believe in this. 
uh, equipment, and I believe it's important for people to know how to use it, even topically, looking at just a few things repeatedly to identify trends and opportunities. So I thought I was going to work with newbies and, and green group students and yellow group students and blue group students, and that is not what happened. What happened was my phone started ringing off the hook with black group students, with red group students, with instructors, with organizations saying, hey, how do we how do we get better when we get stuck? And I say, first off, the plateaus of learning are normal. I don't know. I've lost count of how many drivers have blown it going into a particular corner, made it through and gone, wow. I didn't realize I could go through there that quickly. And then all of a sudden, with a little bit of practice, with a little more discipline, they make that the new normal. And that is how you do better. The problem with all these black, red, and instructors were they were already driving the line fine. We're looking at their video and I'm saying, I can't help you with the line. But you know what? You're, you're overslowing. Well, what's overslowing? It's either pressing the pedal too hard or it's pressing the pedal too long, or both. That's what it is. So let's work on that. Um, but first, let's work on something safe, which is accelerating out of the corner first. Let's not go part throttle, part throttle, part throttle 100. Let's go squeeze, 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 squeeze full. So next slide. The main aim resources I really enjoy because they are more they are less geeky and more understandable are James Colburn's excellent YouTube series. Really, really good. The basic hardware setup for Solo 2DL and Smarty Cam is there. That will help you with setting up the pages. Uh, the next thing, the playlist, uh, getting started with Ray Studio Analysis, super good information right there. And then, of course, information specific to marrying your video with the data from the Solo 2DL. Of course, AIM Sports. LLC has now over 200 uh, great webinars. They, they're about an hour long. Uh, Matt Romanesque gave one today, which was getting ready for the big event, uh, trying to make sure that all your stuff would work and record the video uh, because the hardest part of collecting data is getting out there and getting that data. So once you have that information, you have all kinds of good stuff uh, to, to work with. Let's uh, go ahead. To the next session. So, I'm going to tell you that uh, that the catalyst is a very simple, totally integrated ecosystem. You don't need a computer. You don't need anything. But there is more power in this thing than you can shake a stick at. Not only is there an, a very sophisticated audio coaching which learns as you drive what you are capable of. But it also gives you instant feedback. Like a right seat instructor, it will never replace a right seat instructor because it can't give and can't read the student and can't address specific concerns to the student. But for factual information, this thing is absolutely remarkable. And if you go into audio options on the top right hand side, we'll talk about that later. Uh, you can enable the advanced race coach. I don't know. I don't like that name, but. All I'd like to see is advanced coach. And, and if you go too fast into a corner and come out of that corner slower than you have in the past, it will remember that. And the next time you come around in time for you to do it, it will tell you break 50 feet earlier, break 100 feet earlier. And I don't know any technology that can do that. Um, We'll talk more about the review later on. So next slide. Uh, just like the video from the AIM, review your best lap. So you select laps, you select the, the, uh, the lap you want to watch, which would be your best lap, play it. Um, watch for the turn in, watch for speed at the apex, watch speed at the track out. Uh, you can tell that your brake application by the nose dipping and by the speed dropping. You can see the, the, the front of the car rising. You can see the speed come up. But I want you to pen, pay a lot of attention to how long you are within two or three miles an hour of the minimum speed at all corners. If that is more than two or three seconds, 
then work on that because that means you're slowing too soon and having to wait too long before you accelerate coming out. Next slide. So you pick and watch the fastest lap. And that is by selecting the laps on the bottom, you watch that 147.31 first. Uh, you can scroll through the corners by uh, going forward or, or backwards on the sec segment screen on the left side. And you can scroll through the same corner from lap to lap to judge your consistency by pressing the top right-hand side. Before you go out, watch the optimal because the optimal is a more intelligent stringing together of your best individual corners and sectors. So that optimal lap is what you actually did, but not necessarily all in one lap. And if you can watch that and say, I need to do that, sometimes you can replicate or better the optimal lap time. So that is a really, really good way to look at this. It does get built up over the course of days. So if you're at a three-day event or a two-day or event, or if you're five days with a couple of uh, a couple of groups at, at say Watkins Glen, then all of a sudden you have a building of this ideal optimal lap that is a continual moving benchmark. Now I have had uh, a very good club level drivers and pro drivers a class winner of Petit Le Mans and a two-time 12-hour winner stick one of these catalysts in their car and uh, they went out and they went, you know, one guy, uh, I'll, I'll say it's Cameron Lawrence in a 981 GT4 Club Sport was on the pole in front of 55 cars at VIR by four tenths. He was ahead. We put one of these things in his car and he found another four tenths. And I asked him, I said, what did you do? He said, I just listened to the lady. I was like, what? <laughs> what, what are you talking about? He said, it reinforced the fact that I, of what I was doing right so that I could do more of that. It also allowed me to validate what was in my butt because it would say, keep pushing when it meant I had done better before with, some, with another approach. So this is a very intelligent device. It is definitely worth your while to, to take a look at. Next slide. So the, the nicest thing about the whole thing is this opportunity review. Opportunity one is the area where you can find the most time. Opportunity two is the next best time opportunity. Opportunity three is the third best. But what's great is that it sifts all this information and comes up with three things. And I charge people $1,500, $2,000 a day to tell them this information. And this thing gives it to you every time. And it's pretty accurate. So the best part about this is not only is it an opportunity, but you have four tabs across the top. You have the overview, you have the braking, you have the apex, you have the speed. Now this braking is highlighted. So it shows you the entry speed just below of your average fastest laps in white. This is not your fast lap. It took my mind a little bit to get around this. We're not comparing our fast lap to the optimal. We're comparing our fast average to that. And so if you look on the lower left-hand side of this screen, you have two videos side by side. That, those are screenshots of the break point that you use on average in white and your best breaking performance in purple. If you touch that, it will monopolize the screen and you will be able to see what the difference was in the break point that you used in order to affect a better way. It also always gives you a cue on what you did to do better. So above the map, you achieved your fastest time when you braked later, slightly, harder, slightly, and for a shorter period of time. Well, guess what? That is the essence of more efficient braking. So this is why this is really good. We have strip charts on the top right. No, we don't have grids or cross hatches, but we have those strip charts that we talked about. Acceleration, deceleration, speed next, and the most important part, time slip which is a real time tally from the beginning of the segment to the end of the segment of the difference between the two laps. 
Areas where it is straight across, where the cursor is, nothing different. Areas where it's going down or up, particularly the latter half, is the area where the real gain is occurring. So just because it shows you that you gained in the segment, this time strip chart shows you where in this segment you really made a difference. Next slide. So step two, the speed graph is right there. We're looking for the same thing. Just look for anomalies. That, that's really what it boils down to. The acceleration breaking graph does show lengthy, lengthy shifts. And in a, in a six-speed car, uh, you know, and especially an older car, um, you can you can really see that. And, and you can speed up your shifts without damaging boxes if you do your timing correctly. Uh, let's go ahead to the next slide. So here we are with the acceleration, deceleration. We have opportunity one. This is the overview. We have the graphs on top, graphs on the bottom. This is the reason why it's circled is because this is the area of the segment where the major difference was. And on the optimal lap, uh, it was clear from the speed channel that the car was going faster, further after the beginning of the left edge of the speed graph, uh, that middle graph, that they were going faster for longer, break later and in a more linear way. So the speed drop was a straight line. You really do wanna see the speed drop as a straight line. You don't wanna see it uh, concave, like the white, uh, or heaven forbid, convex, which is starting to break gently and then going, whoa, and the sphincter channel uh, or the, the, the sphincter sensor channel goes off the scale. Let's go to the next session. All right. So acceleration braking, hard acceleration, higher and longer before the first break. Go ahead. Sorry. So uh, again, sector analysis, break it into smaller pieces. This is how the catalyst is working. You can set this up. <clears throat> you can set this up easily in AIM. You can set it up easily in VBOX. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's actually automatically done in VBOX and automatically done in the catalyst. So most of the work <clears throat> is done. Yeah. Go ahead. So one of the things that we have not talked about is the fact that you now have the ability to use an Android or a phone app to be able to make uh, real-time graphs. And this is really helpful and it works really well. Uh, it gives you track notes. It gives you uh, summary uh, statistics, which are, are very helpful. And it gives you speed variation, graphs, everything uh, that you could possibly need just on a simple phone or an iPad. So that works very, very well. So let's go ahead to the next, the next slide. So here we are. Now this is something that not a lot of people are doing. Uh, it is relatively easy to pull out, uh, to pull out a card with data overlay on the video. Um, it is also easy to call up a previous session. There's plenty of uh, instructions on how to do this. But if you uh, ask it to render the video uh, with the information on the background, you've got the uh, friction circle on the right-hand side, the speedo on the left side, lap time, last lap, session best, and then the delta, which is how far ahead or behind you are of your previous lap. Uh, you can take the card out of the catalyst and save that information for posterity. And that works really, really, really well. I think a lot of people, this was the number one feature that people requested when this device came out was they said, look, I want to post this up on YouTube and I want to have somebody like Dion Von Mulkey look it over, or uh, I want to save this because this was a pretty good performance. Um, and this is really, really helpful. The comparison lap time could be the session best, could be today's best, or it could be the optimal over the course of several days. But this is really good information. And this thing is capable of doing much more than most people are using it for. Go ahead. All right. So Catalyst Resources. Uh, I think the first order of business is Ross Bentley's uh, 
515.1 review. This is available on speedsecrets.com. Um, and then, of course, the YouTube video for ex exporting the video with the overlay and then use tips from Garmin. Um, we have VBOX resources from VBOX Motorsport and, of course, James Colburn videos that we talked about before. Let's try next. OK, one of the people, a lot of people say, you know, hey, why do you like the VBOX? It's awfully expensive. Uh, you know, it's a big box, that sort of thing. Um, one of the reasons why I like race logic is because there's a very keen integration between VBOX and Porsche. So starting in 2018, Porsche required all GT3 Cup cars and now GT4 cars to be uh, in competition with the VBOX. And one of the reasons why the VBOX is recommended, at least for me, is it takes me a little bit of time to set up the split chart reports in AIM. And uh, it won't break it down to pieces, parts. The catalyst won't. It'll just offer me opportunities. Whereas the VBOX can do side-by-side -side video instantly of your very best seminar, or your very best sector versus uh, your best lap. And that uh, just saves a tremendous amount of time. And that's one of the reasons why this is a, a pretty good system because the software is good. Obviously it has the same thing that we talked about with the aim. We have a friction circle in the background of the video. We have a throttle bar and a brake bar with a, a consequent number. And we have engine RPM, speed, gear. Um, we can instantly make um, evaluations on whether or not we're early. Also, one of the things that I really, really like and stress a lot is people talk about apexes all the time, but they don't look at the heading uh, where they intersect with the inside curve. So uh, it is really, really important to begin looking at the uh, angle of incidence when you come close to the inside of a curve uh, and measure the apex as an apex area rather than an apex point. And this device really allows us to do that. And it's very, very helpful. Let's try the next session. So you'll load the file in uh, Circuit Tools 2 in VBOX. Uh, you just pull out a, a, a card like the AIM camera card. You plug it in. All the data is on there. All the video is on there. No sweat. But the cool thing about VBOX is we have an ideal lap, which is the same thing as an optimal lap. Uh, same thing as a, a best theoretical lap uh, is all the video components stitched together in one lap. And you can uh, select uh, the little uh, clacker board on the top center section of Circuit Tools 2, and it will make the video for you. Um, and then you click the HD speedometer to the left of it, and that puts a number uh, a speedometer number right there on the lower right-hand side of the video. And all of a sudden it is great. You have all the best sectors stitched together. You can compare speeds at the same position uh, instead of a length into a lap, which is really good. It shows you instantly where to focus on next, because if there are blue, purple sectors under there, hey, you want to do more of that. Next slide. So HD2 sector and the ideal lap selection. Um, we have a situation here where the first three sectors uh, are faster than our second quickest lap by the, by, I don't know, three and a half tenths. So the reference lap is this 157.16. The driver, our driver, the fastest lap they did was a one minute 57.16 seconds. And their sector time for each little division on this start finish wizard map uh, is the amount of time it took through each of these boxes on the top row. But yet other laps, including a nine minute and 53 second lap on the top left hand side on the bottom, had two sections of six tenths of a second uh, or 0 0.06 seconds on top of that. So uh, it is really important. We're looking at exactly the same squiggly lines as we did before. Uh, there's a little bit of coasting going on in the speed trace, uh, which is on the lower central section. Yep. It looks like a hockey stick. And uh, we used to talk a lot about having a situation where you really wanted to slow down in a slow corner and then speed right back up. 
Here, what's happened is the driver is done. They're braking, but they're not yet at a point where they can go back to power. And you can see that, that it's like a hockey stick right there. And then the brake on the lower graph goes straight down. Then it goes up, but only halfway uh, or two thirds of the way to the point where there's no thrust forward or back. And we really, that is indicative to me that we're done braking too soon or we're late on the throttle or both. And, and you can use any device and this graph, whether it be the Catalyst, the AIM, the V-Box, uh, Cosworth, MoTeC, it doesn't matter. It's going to show you this. So let's go to the next segment. Um, so automatic generation of segments and sectors is helpful because you don't have to calculate it. Uh, you find and you focus on the driver's exceptional performance. You learn what you did to do more of it. And then this side-by-side -side video comparison to position. So let me, let me explain a little bit about that. Very often when you look at two videos together, especially in AIM Ray Studio 2 or Ray Studio 3 analysis, they are off just a tiny bit. They're not exactly together. Sometimes that happens in VBox. But if you select uh, to compare the two laps by position, you can look at, at where the car is in exactly the same lateral or longitudinal position and lat longitudinal position and see the real difference in speed, the real difference in the heading as it approaches the apex or exits the corner and really gain some insight there. Um, so best lap red versus best lap, uh, best sectors, the purple, which is the best of the session. <coughs> um, that is really, really important. Uh, if they run VBox, you can do, you can load anybody's and, and combo. This, that's what's really nice about all these systems is if you do have uh, a coach or another friend who's quicker, um, you can put them in your car and create a new benchmark. Um, I don't really recommend tailoring your driving exactly off of other drivers because I think every driver is a variable. And I think some drivers, the reason why some drivers do better than other drivers is simply because they have more confidence, comfort, and practice in a particular skill execution or area of the track. The reason why professionals tend to drive quicker than club level drivers is because they're doing it all the time. And they're doing it in every car and they become acclimated to that and their ability. The most successful uh, professional drivers that I know uh, will drive slightly over the limit. But if you are watching the video, it doesn't look like there's any drama. But yet the driver is making constant corrections, not big sawing corrections, but, but you can tell that the car is on tenter hooks. It's not completely connected to the road. And for you to go faster, you're going to have to become comfortable being slightly uncomfortable. Thanks to my friend, Ross Bentley, who I think distilled that thought just perfectly. So let's go ahead to the next sector segment. HD2, best lap versus best sectors. It tells you right away. Now, this is a comparison between uh, the lead pro driver on the left. Uh, I'm sorry, the lead pro driver on the... Oh... No, this is not. This is driver versus driver. And so what happened was he did a 57.1, but yet he did a 22 plus 5, 27 plus 4, 31. So he did this sector, sector 1, sector 2, sector 3, which is all we're looking at in the graphs and in the video. That's just braking for turn 1 at VIR, accelerating, braking for turn 3 at VIR, accelerating breaking for turn four at VIR, and then that pause about the 320, 340 mark on the graph, which is turn five. Um, now, the beauty is that we have this time gap business, this delta T on the bottom. It shows that from about 120 on or 110 on, that that line is relatively flat. That line is relatively flat. But right where the cursor was, and right where the arrow is now, that is where the biggest gain occurred. And it was simply 
by getting the car wound up just a tiny bit more because you can see the purple line below the red line at the 80 vertical mark and and tries to roll a little bit more speed in with the red has to get out of it and the the purple lap or the blue lap in this particular case which is the second fastest lap can pick up throttle at six miles an hour difference at the exit it's good for a quarter of a second and i know people that would kill for a quarter of a second kill for it so the best merrill lynch ad i ever saw in my life was a guy rolling around in his uh, ac cobra with full gear on he said for years and years i i moved around billions of dollars now i would give all of those billions for two tenths of a second is a great ad next uh so next segment we've got again this is zoomed in this is the whole lap of what we were just looking at cursor still in the same place um actually it's it's the next corner which would be turn three and this would be um the fastest lap against the ideal lap so the 57 is not the benchmark the 5674 is a, is a new benchmark and and we can see that exiting turn 1 uh the red on the bottom uh the red circle on the bottom left that is the big improvement there was another big improvement after a little bit of a giveaway on the second red circle to the right then there's a little bit of room at oak tree which is at the at the next one and then there's a little bit of room at hog pen, which is that last right hand, uh, right hand red circle. So how do you prioritize that? Look for the biggest drop. I would say you need to, you need to focus that. Now this, this is a, uh, this is very interesting. If we, where is the time between these two drivers? So the blue driver is doing a 59, the red driver is doing a 57. Okay. Well, right there, uh, we have, we have quite a bit of time, half a second right there. Low risk. Car's not going very fast. Focus on doing that first. Uh, don't, uh, don't work on the fast stuff. I mean, everybody's sitting there saying, well, I got to go flat through the uphill S's. I got to go flat through the S's at Watkins Glen. Yes, it does make a difference. But as a percentage, if you go from 110 to 115 miles an hour through the S's, that is a percentage of the whole speed is not as much as if you go 51 miles an hour instead of 45 miles an hour in the slow stuff. Okay, that's double the percentage. So what I'm trying to do is help you understand that there is a priority that can preserve safety and reduce your exposure to risk. Now, I'm not saying it's it's not important to work on the uphill S's. The blue car where this is showing right now uh, has just finished turning left on the flat and is ready to go to the first right going up the hill at VIR. Actually, maybe turn nine. I'm sorry. So, uh, so we're fairly far up the hill. We're going to go up to the right. Uh, the blue car is doing great. It, uh, the difference between the two cars on the far left-hand circle on the bottom, right there, eight tenths of a second between the cars. Okay. Um, so uh, the, the slow car is eight tenths behind the faster car at that point. Let's go to the next slide. Now we're going to go to the place where uh, that delta T drops a little bit. Just because the guy was going faster on the, on the previous slide and it is going through faster uh, on the speed graph on the top, people say, uh, if we look right under the 129 miles an hour at that red circle, we see white, we see void, we see space between those two speed traces. Normally, people would say, okay, I've got to bridge that space. The red car has to bring it up, has to pull up his big boy pants and get going. Well, guess what? The, the fact that the blue car goes that much faster, it, it only adds 0.17 seconds. And yet we, we made up half a second at turn four with less risk. So that's what I'm asking you to think about. Next slide. Total time differential prioritize. Just divide up the track, divide the changes in the Delta T, pick the biggest ones. In this particular case would be point, half a second 
from oak tree to the breaking at the end of the back straight, that's what I work on first. Then the next thing I work on is breaking for four, uh, for 14 uh, and accelerating to the break point for hog pen. That's half a second. So this is how you find these time. Uh, learning, uh, let's go to the next. Here are the learning resources. They're in the slide pack. Very good information. Julian Thomas, I met him at Sebring in 2010. Uh, he built um, GPS calibration equipment for military weaponry. And he went racing and he said, there must be a way to use this technology to help me go faster. And that's where this comes from. And he's convinced Porsche to use it for their testing and validation for new car vehicles. All the Nürburgring records runs, Randy Pope's record run, David Donahue at Road America, all that stuff was done on this equipment. So it's kind of cool. Um, so how do you use data? Let's close it up. Review the data. It, this, this, slide, this slide is just, you know, repeating what, what you yeah. covered at the beginning about the sequence yeah. uh, of yeah. reviewing video then looking at the fundamental skills. And if you have time, then the, the deeper dive. So this is just a reminder. And then here's, I'll let you do this one, but uh, th this is, sure. I think, some of the key points you've highlighted. Well, this is the crux of it all. And, and, and Bill and I have had some wonderful conversations, you know, in preparation for this presentation because uh, there is no one data system that is better than another. They all measure roughly the same thing with roughly the same uh, uh, accuracy. Uh, but the video is super, super important because that is the way you can assimilate the most information in the least amount of time. Uh, the graphs serve to validate that. Try not to look at one graph. Try to look at more than one graph so that you can validate that what is shown on the graph is in fact true and not an anomaly like a lost GPS signal or something like that. Sec sector analysis finds time in DE. So you don't need a clear lap to define your performance. And that is what another thing that data is really, and video is really, really good for, is you don't need a clean lap in a crowded DE or a happy hour at Chin or any of these organizations uh, to, to find time. Uh, A-B comparison, that's the only way to know for sure. Our butts, again, are notoriously inaccurate. And, uh, you know, sometimes we think, well, coming out of a corner in second gear, the thrust at the back, oh, man, the motor's singing. I must be going faster. But you had to overslow in order to make the lower gear work, and you're actually losing time through that segment. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. Mm -hmm. That That's terrific, Peter. So let's... Uh turn off the slides here and uh, we covered a lot of ground, but uh, um, the, um, the, the I'll turn it to the chiefs on the call if you have any questions. One, one thing while I'm looking to see what questions we have, um, when you and I talked, we talked about looking for U versus V shapes on the speed graph. And uh, uh, I think it would be useful just to, to highlight that for, for folks. Um, so, so let's talk about that one thing. Um, that is why the speed graph is the money channel, because you don't need any other measures to know whether or not you're efficient going into a corner and coming out, because that means you slowed, you've, you've arranged the end of braking to coincide with the point where the car is pointed in the direction that you can go back to power and continue to accelerate out of the corner. Now, a lot of people say, well, I have arrow. I've got, uh, I've got big wings. I've got a splitter. I've got uh, more additional stuff. Arrow, especially in a GT car, uh, is really more to combat lift than to add a lot of downforce. However, downforce doesn't really come into play until speeds above 75 miles an hour. So if you look at Watkins Glen, Minimum speed at turn one, there's not a lot of people that are doing 75 miles an hour minimum at turn one, although they should be. Um, and then there's a lot of 60 to 60 mile an hour corners. I mean, toe of the boot, uh, heel of the boot, uh, nine. Um, turn 11 is 10 miles an hour, generally, slower than uh, turn 10. 
And that ratio is important. When you go to Sebring, it's important that turn 13 be 10 miles an hour quicker than turn 10, which is a corner that is very similar in geometry, but different in radius. So this V business is really important in the slower corners, anything below 70 miles an hour men for sure, because it means that you're correctly judging the end of braking to the point where you can go back to power and continue. In the faster corners, it is super important that you be very gentle with your braking and your release of the braking and rolling speed into the corner and then squeezing or rolling on power uh, because you don't want to upset the car in a very fast corner. Turn 10 uh, at, uh, at Watkins Glen is a prime example. Um, you know, turn 10 at VIR prime example, the kink at uh, Road America, that sort of thing. So, so the U versus V shape is something that is absolutely apparent the moment you open the screen and something that you can zero in on right away. Yep. 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 Great. Yeah. That, that's terrific. Uh, other questions uh, from Peter, folks? Peter, you mentioned before the, which direction the car is pointed when it's at V mid. Okay. Is there something in the trace that would indicate that that is an issue or is it just really looking at the video where you can kind of just go back and forth between the video and the data and figure out that, oh, you know what? I should have just been a little bit more patient and let the car just rotate a little more before I get on the gas or, you know what I mean? That is a great, that, that's a great observation. It's not even a question. It's, a, it's the proper observation. So the trace, if the trace has difficulty, so if you have a situation where you're slowing down and the car is not accelerating right away, that means that somebody has to complete the corner before they can. the car is pointed in the right direction and they can accelerate. So that coupled with the video would allow an, an explanation for why a particular trace doesn't look optimal. The reason why I like the video and this, and you've hit the nail right on the head, every driver has a go, no go system, which means that if they sail into the corner and they're turning into the corner and they realize that they're too early and they're gonna pick up the apex area too soon, that they have, they get the car settled down and go slower than they ought to, to regain the line. We talk about regaining the line all the time. So that is why the heading is so important. If, if you can sit there and you identify right away that you're not on an optimal line and you have to wait, then that's going to show up as a speed trace that's very low and a video that shows somebody turning in too early, picking up the apex area too soon, and having to wait excruciatingly long to be able to get back to power. Good. I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> Another question? It's, I'll just say one more thing. With the big cars, this is doubly important. I mean, I think we can all agree that, that the cars that are showing up in DEs today are incredibly competent, faster than race cars were 20 years ago, easily. And so um, it is doubly important to be able to make sure the car is pointed in the right direction uh, at all times, and especially not go to power, not go to significant power uh, until the car is close to being pointed in the direction you want to go. Um, I think a lot of people are automatically programmed to say, if I'm off the brakes, I need to be back on power when that can be very counterproductive. And that results in the W in the speed trace. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah. excellent. Good. You're know, also in these systems, you talk a lot about the uh, what the computer or what the software calculates as the theoretic best lap, right? Where does linked corners come into play where you exit, right, uh, a corner for the first part, and then you're actually suboptimal in terms of the ideal entry to the second corner. You know what I mean? That, so that is, on... That's great. That's a great question. And I'll tell you that, that every data system, Cosworth, Motec, AIM, VBOX is dumb. 
and does not parse the end of one sector to the beginning of the other. So it doesn't make a judgment uh, of whether or not that's even possible. So all those numbers have to be, you know, taken with a grain of salt. That's why it's particularly good to be able to watch the, the, the ideal lap on video, because then you can see in those link corners, what is the, the split between coming out of one and going into the other. The Garmin is a little different in the fact that the Garmin does in fact throw away split joints that are not possible. So the optimal lap in a Garmin is doable because it throws out uh, a section more than six feet apart and, and more than a certain difference in angle or heading from the end of one to the beginning of the other. It's very sophisticated, but that's a great point. The idea, uh, the idea is, I, I mean, I have been to a million uh, sessions at the Seneca Lodge bar where people say, I didn't get a clean lap all day, but I did a 56.4. <laughs> and when you play that 56.4, it doesn't show them sailing off into the paved area on the outside of the exit of eight. And then all of a sudden the next segment, perfect exit out of eight. <laughs> Not possible. Sorry, wrong. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's, that, that, that is a great observation and something that is important to realize in, in all legacy or conventional logging systems. The reason I, I just point out the Garmin is that they, they didn't want to lead. I mean, the idea of a four billion dollar company coming out with a device that tells you where and how to go faster is like a recipe for a litigant disaster. Um, so they they have made it a very uh, you know an overriding uh, priority to make sure that you can do uh, what it says it thinks you can do. So that's great. Good. Okay. Anybody else? Going once? Well, Peter, we thank you good, very Bill. much. You did good. <laughs> yeah. No, you did it, great. The, you did this great. is uh, this has been really, really good. good time. Uh, thank you again for uh, all the work you put into this. We really good appreciate time. it, and uh, um, we look. We will be down to VIR in a month. We may run into you, so uh, we. Uh, you most certainly will. <laughs> good, good. Hey Peter, before before you run, uh, uh, coaching to coaching. Um, besides the videos, do you use any of the animated graphing uh, on any of the tools? Uh, so you're you're playing the lap through the data. So I I would say that that is one of the most useful tools of the data is animated maps, yeah. and part of that is because and also heat maps which are color-coded tracks uh, colored by specific channels. So in a name, you can make a, a color uh, map, heat map of say throttle position. So you can see exactly where on the, on the track you are at what opening. And that's even more accurate than watching the video. And, and to work on trail braking, you would color use as a color channel for an aim map, you would use brake pressure or brake switch. So what happens is all of a sudden, man, I swore I was trail braking. No, you're not. You're off before the, the radius of the corner begins. So yes, I, I think the, the whole idea of also racing one car against another, racing one lap against another. So where it starts at start finish, and this is particularly good in the V-Box also, because if you play it from the start of the lap, you can see where the relative position of the cars gain and lose and come up with a great deal of good information from just that comparison. So next time we have you, we'll, we'll, um, we'll figure out how to do some, some of those animations for people so they can watch and you can talk through that. That'd be fun. Uh, right. You just you just got my attention because uh, I've seen that, but I have no idea how to do that. So, uh, so that sounds like fun. Uh, yeah, that's, that's something that's very useful because I mean, again, you can construct comparisons that don't exist in real life that can help you. Interesting. 
Okay. You know, you, you just mentioned the um, the Cosworth system. Uh, how, yeah. how does that compare to these three systems we discussed today? So in my opinion, you know, the Cosworth system is a system, one of the great things about modern cars and especially about Porsche Motorsports North America uh, mm. is they have since 2014 used Cosworth in a lot of the cars, the 718, that sort of thing, uh, all the, the, the 991 and 992 cars. Uh, it is a very sophisticated system. And unfortunately, it is designed specifically for a dedicated engineer to pull the information and arrange it using a workbook uh, to see exactly the same information many times displayed in the same way as AIM uh, and some of VBOX. VBOX is a little more basic in its display. AIM can be mild to wild now. Um, but Cosworth is also integrated into the car to check for health items much, much more so. So for instance, engine health, crankcase pressure, uh, which you can determine the relative health and any change in the car very simply and easily by creating a worksheet in the Cosworth uh, to allow you to check vitals. So it's like a it's like a super uh, a, a very sophisticated laboratory test uh, available to you uh, about your cup car or your 718 uh, GT4 club sport. But the Cosworth is good. I, I think the Cosworth is difficult uh, to learn, difficult to use. Uh, PMNA, Porsche Motorsports North America, maintains an excellent site for all owners of factory built race cars. If you create a login, you can gain access to training and sample templates and all the information required to use that system to its full capability. Um, do I think that that information, I do not use the Cosworth for driver coaching, although you can. Part of the reason for that is because the Cosworth does not have an integrated video solution unless you pay two grand for that version of the software. Um, whereas the other people that we've talked about uh, tonight offer it for free. And I think, again, there's still a lot of low hanging fruit. Even the best club level driver can find using these relatively simple systems. Great. Great. Terrific. Good stuff, really good stuff. Yeah. All right, going once, going twice. Again, really uh, informative seminar. Well done, Peter, thank you very much. And uh, I uh, know that yeah, this is gonna get a lot of watching on YouTube uh, because I know I'm gonna go back and listen to some of it myself. So uh, uh, really good. Don't try and monetize it there, Bill. You're not making <laughs> any money out of this. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate it very much. And and like I said, I mean, I've said this before publicly and I've put it on Renlist and everywhere else. I think you guys run a fantastic program. Um, you are constantly investing uh, in your in your core and your members. And uh, and I think it pays off. Great. Well, thank, thank you for the kind words. And thank you again for tonight. And at this point, I think we'll uh, say good night and uh, wish every everyone uh, a good evening. See you at BIR. And see you see at you BIR. At BIR. Yes.